Philippians 1, 9 through 11, Paul writes, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's sing praise to God this morning by singing. Sing praise to God who reigns above. If you would stand with me. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight declares the Lord. Let's sing of God's great love for us.
we come to, as we return to John 15, and we've heard in the upper room that Jesus has massive plans for his disciples, is your prayer that God would help you grasp the heights of his plans for us. And is your prayer that we would be taught until this church is built for his glory. And if these are your prayers, we are, this is how the, the body of Christ grows. And we are before the word with a posture of humility. Well, we are in John 15 again, and we'll be here for just another, another uh, a few more weeks, another little while here. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of review this morning because obviously there's a lot here and we only got to verse 6 last week. So this morning we're going to study verses 7 down through 11. And uh, as I was meditating on this passage, you know that we began the, the Jesus is the vine, the garden of God passage last week. Jesus is the vine, God is the gardener, we are the, the fruit, the branches that bear fruit. And so we'll be continuing that word image that Jesus uses today. And, and, and as I was reflecting on this morning, I, I had forgotten that I have actually had extensive interaction with, uh, specifically, a grapevine at one point in my life. Now, it wasn't interaction as in I was, like, tending the vine, all right? Uh, we lived in a rental home when I was young. I don't know how young I was. I was young, but I was young enough to remember this. And my family was, we were in a transitional time in our, in our lives, in the ministry, my dad's ministry. And so we lived in a rental home. And, and in this rental home, it was, a, it was an interesting home for young children because it was an artist. An artist lived there, and so there, were, there was art everywhere. It, it, was a, it was an interesting home. But, but one of the things about this home is it had a massive grapevine. And, uh, and, you know, it was, it was, it was staked into the ground, and it was actually, it was, a, it was, a, it was, the vine had grown to the point where they needed, uh, uh, they needed um, a, a large trellis that, that obviously, uh, that, that was, that was staked into the ground on four sides, and it was an extensive vine. And there were certain things about this vine that were certain. One of the things that was absolutely certain about this vine is that my brother and I would get in grape fights. And we would throw grapes at one another. And these were the soft, like, mushy ones. You know what I'm talking about? They were perfect for grape fights. And uh, we ruined too many clothes, so we eventually had to stop that. And the other thing that was certain about this grapevine, now this is going to come as a shock to you, okay? The other thing that was certain about this grapevine is that it produced grapes. Okay? You all with me up to this point? All right. The grapevine produced grapes. Well, there are certain things that Jesus says about what it means to be in the vine. And one of the certain things that he says, we talked about it last week, we're talking about it again today, today, one of the certain things that he says is if you are a branch, so if you are a true disciple, not one of the branches that pretends to be a disciple, that, that fakes it, that God eventually uh, takes, takes away and burns, God the gardener, if you are a true branch, you will bear fruit you can be certain that a healthy grapevine will bear fruit, and you can be certain that a healthy branch that is a believer will bear fruit. However, there are other things, and we didn't quite get to them last week because we mostly just kind of unpacked the word picture. There are other things that are assured to those who are true disciples. There are other things that are certain, that if you are a true branch, there are other certainties that Christ deals with in the passage. And and, and this is where Jesus actually begins to unpack the picture himself. And he will for the next few verses. And you'll find that not only can you be certain that if you are a true disciple, a true branch, you'll grow true fruit, there are other things that Jesus says will absolutely uh, be given you, that you can be absolutely certain you will have access to these things. You'll have joy in these things. And we'll talk about those things in just a few moments. But I want to show you, let's, actually, let's read the passage. 
And then I'll show you our main idea, uh, explain to you our main idea from the passage this morning. So we are actually going to start all the way in verse 1. I know I said it's verse 7 to 11 as our primary text this morning, but we're going to start in verse 1 and read down to 11 so that we get the whole picture, so that we're reminded of our foundation uh, and where we spent last week, where we were last week, all right? 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, that's the vine dresser, takes away And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in me. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. This morning, I want to deal with the primary idea from this passage that continuing in Christ, remember that's the word that we used for, uh, remember I said that's another, that's a substitutionary word that you could use for abide here. This word continuing has the same idea of abiding. Remember I said this is an active passage. The disciples are doing things, and so continue is another good word to use here. So the the main truth that we're going to deal with from this text is that Continuing in Christ flourishes fruit for Christ and assures the love and joy of Christ. Say it again. Continuing in Christ or abiding in Christ flourishes. This is the idea of growth. You will produce fruit. Flourishes fruit for Christ and assures. You can be certain of these things. That you will enjoy the love of Christ and be filled with the joy of Christ. It is these certainties in addition to the absolute certainty that true disciples bear fruit that we will deal with this morning. That you can be absolutely certain of the love of Christ and the joy of Christ. Let's pray. We'll begin to unpack this text together. Jesus, we're we're eager to be discipled by you this morning. Spirit, we're, we're eager to be taught by you. God, we're eager to worship. And so speak, O Lord, until your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Give us ears to hear and hearts to obey, hearts to confess if we need to. Now is the time so that we may hear fully, unencumbered by the noise of our soul or noise of sin. We ask these things for your praise in the name of your Son. Amen. Well, just let's do a little bit of recap, because, because last week was, was, was a lot, and I know that. So let's just do a little bit of recap so that we can build where we are, remind ourselves of where we are in verse 7, all right? Remember Jesus says, we, we go, we're in the scene of the garden of God, Jesus is the true vine, he's the one in, in whom we're supposed to continue, in whom we're supposed to abide. Jesus... Uh, is, is, is instructing his disciples to abide in him. There's a larger context going on. Obviously, we talked about it's this upper room. It's a transitional passage, all these things from, uh, from, the, from the old covenant, new covenant, uh, the, the, the temporary indwelling to the permanent indwelling of the spirit, the idea of the new commandment of love. So all of these background transitional ideas that are taking place in the passage. And Jesus says, you as my true disciples must continue in the vine and and he and Jesus is the vine. The, obviously, the other operative character in the Garden of God is God himself. And remember, he does two things in the passage. He prunes 
the true disciples, that they may produce more fruit, and he cleans off the bad branches and cleans up the bad branches, the ones that aren't true disciples, so that they are not detracting from the vine. He purifies it, he purifies and he prunes. And remember we said that that's essentially one activity. By pruning, he is purifying the branch. And in pruning, the branch produces more fruit. We obviously talked about the reality that we are in Christ. That was, a, and, I know, and I know that wasn't the main thrust of the passage last week, but that was one of the main theologies we dealt with last week, that what it means to be in Christ, that we live out the life of Christ because we are one with him and he is one with us. And we did some, we did some New Testament theology about what it means to be one in Christ. And Jesus is, is building on top now, or, or it actually better, uh, it'd be better to say he's, he's explaining now this word picture himself. So he gives the word picture, he gives some commentary uh, as he goes along, and now Jesus really begins to, to apply this to his disciples. And so this is much of, if you can imagine like a message, or like when, when a message is preached to you, there's the explanation, this is the, there's the application. This is where Jesus begins to apply this to his disciples. And so all of these things are leading us into verse 7. And what's he say? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The first thing I want you to see from this passage as it relates to flourishing the fruit of, uh, for Christ and of Christ is that we have an assurance of assistance. We are assured assistance from Christ. If you abide in me, if you continue in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Jesus has already said something similar to this verse back in chapter 14. He says that greater works will, will they do that, uh, that work the works of Christ. And so this is a very active passage. I'll explain that passage to you in just a moment. Um, But as I said, this is not the first time Jesus said something like this. That passage is going to help us better understand this passage. Because there are a few ways to take this passage that would not be, this verse, excuse me, verse uh, verse 7 specifically, that, that would not, one of them is not good. And the other is just not what Jesus has in mind when he says it, okay? So there's two potential misunderstandings from verse 7. The first one, and I go after him all the time, so you're not going to be surprised by it. The first misunderstanding you get from verse 7 is some sort of health and wealth, prosperity gospel, empty deceitfulness. Okay? Ask whatever you want of Jesus, and he'll give it to you. Do you need a new car? Ask it of Jesus. Do you need a new house? Ask it of Jesus. Do you need better children? Ask it of Jesus. And you say you're being, you're being crazy. I'm not being silly. That's what people say. Like Jesus is a game show host that can just give you this car and give you this house. They would probably ignore verse 6 of this passage, which says that God takes away fake disciples and burns them. Probably wouldn't like verse 6. I don't think anyone here has that in mind. I don't think anyone heard that when I read that because I think you're a mature congregation. You are a mature congregation. So that's one way you could take this. I don't think anyone heard that because we're not oriented to hear that. Hopefully you're not oriented to hear that. If that's what you want to hear, I'm just telling you, I love you, you're in the wrong place. All right? The other one is actually a mature question to ask. And it's actually a a very personal and kind of deep question Uh, reflective question to ask. And it goes something like this. Have you ever asked something of Jesus and it not been given to you? So the, the, the explanation what Jesus says here doesn't actually match with your experiences. And you as a believer, you believe God, you trust God, you, you trust the word, but, but what he says here doesn't seem to match with your experiences. And that's obviously a very logical question to ask here. And this is why we learn to read the Bible with the Bible, because the Bible answers the Bible. And as I said, Jesus has already said something like this once before. And that passage helps us better understand 
this passage. So I want to deal with, with maybe that, that concern, because it is a valid concern. When we read the Bible, it, it is absolutely true, and we've all experienced it. Um, we read the Bible, and we, we come across something that doesn't match our experiences, which is where we have to be careful that our experiences don't form our theology, our theology expor- informs our experiences, Right? We don't, place, we don't place personal understanding over biblical understanding. Uh, back in chapter 14, verse 11, we, we are reminded that, that this passage, the upper room passage, is, a, is a, an action-oriented passage. And there's many things in it. It's a promise-oriented passage. It's an action-oriented passage. But the action of the text is that Jesus is saying, you as the disciples, remember now that Judas is gone, you as the disciples are going to do things. You're going to be busy. Okay? So look at verse 11 of chapter 14. You can just flip back a page. Maybe you don't even have to. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. So we've got works in mind. We've got doing the ministry of the gospel, of the, 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 the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ in mind. Jesus has his own ministry in mind, and he is handing this off to the disciples, and the Holy Spirit will strengthen them to do this great ministry. But they will, of course, also have the presence and the strength of Jesus. And greater works than these will he, that's the disciple, do. I'm not going to fully go into that because remember we said that that's not ability, that's, that's, that's more the idea of magnitude. The disciples will accomplish multiplication work, the multiplication ministry of Jesus Christ. Because I am going into the Father, I'm going to the Father. Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. You say, we've been through 14, I don't remember this. I didn't cover it, I didn't cover it very thoroughly in 14 because I knew we were coming back to it, okay? So if you thought I ignored it, I didn't, not on purpose anyway. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So here we have to ask the question, what does he mean when he says do? What Jesus means when he says do is what he has intended for the disciples to do, which is the gospel works of discipleship, the ministry of Christ. So he's not just saying anything, if you need anything, if you ask it, I will give it to you. It's not that general. Remember, there's a very specific context here. Jesus is addressing his disciples that he will send out. This this audience is very narrow. And from this narrow audience, we then take application a little more broadly, more broad applications, which we, we can be, we need to be careful and we just kind of generalize everything. Uh, otherwise, we'll end up in places like this. But if we understand the specific audience, it makes sense that these disciples would make specific requests. Do you remember the disciples in Matthew 17? And there's a boy that needs a demon cast out and they couldn't do it. And they come back to Jesus, and they say, why couldn't we cast him out? What did Jesus say? You didn't have the faith. You didn't have the faith to do it. And then that's when he goes into the kingdom of God. It's like a mustard seed. So this, this miracle sets up this teaching of Jesus. So do you not think that there are times in the, in the lives of these people, these 11 men, in their lives, when they're doing the ministry of Christ, when they're going, I don't know how to do this work in front of me. This is too big. I, can't, I don't know how to cast out this demon. I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of the disciples, all right? Not us. They've got a ministry work of Christ that's too big for them. And then they recall the works of Jesus. Ask for my help in my name. So that's what Jesus means here when he says... Ask me anything, and in my name, I will do it. What he says, if, what he means is if you have a ministry work that's in front of you that's too big for you, because they all are, ask in my name, and it will be done for you. So it's not just this general, um, you need something from Jesus, and he provides it for you. It's very specific. Now listen, that does not mean there's no application for us. 
the underlying principle that Jesus communicates here is relevant across all the generations of Christ's people. You say, why do you say that? Because I think we very often don't accomplish things for Christ or we don't do as much as we could because we don't ask for help. Just like what we talked about last week. You can't do anything unless I strengthen you. Remember, what, remember we said what he means there is you can't do anything truly eternal in value. Thomas Edison once said, opportunity is so often missed because it's dressed like overalls, dressed in overalls and looks like work. And I think for believers, we often miss gospel opportunity because it looks like too much work. Bible reading? Uh, I'm really tired today. Rather than Jesus, uh, I'm exhausted, you know that. You, you know my week. I need your help right now. Church attendance, it's a lot of commitment. It's a lot of commitment. Man. Like Sunday mornings, this is my time to sleep in. Rather than, Jesus, I'm so tired, but I need this. Help me. I know I'm supposed to love my neighbors, but they're all the way over there. I don't understand them. They don't understand me. We don't have the same lives, whatever. What if you just ask Jesus for help? Giving the gospel to somebody? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't words well talk stuff. I don't know what to say. I've not been trained in this. Well, you just asked that Jesus would help you. So actually, though the disciples would cast out demons and all those things, and we're not called to that, what Jesus is saying to them means the exact same thing it means, he means to say to us. There are things that are too big for us in life that we don't have the ability for. He's called us to, to massive gospel purposes and they're all too big for us. What if we just ask Jesus for help? Listen, the size of your prayers and petitions are proportionate to your view of the size of God. I'll say that again. The size of your prayers and petitions are proportionate to your view of the size of God. So if you really believed God is big enough to help you, if you really believe Jesus is strong enough to help you, you should ask Him. If Jesus is big to you, you'll ask big things. If Jesus is strong to you, you will ask for strength. And if Jesus does everything for a purpose, you will ask for this divine assistance to those purposes that he has intended for you. So we are assured assistance here. Actually, and I, I, think, it's far, I think it's far better what, what Jesus really means here than just it doesn't match with my experiences and all that. What he's saying is, I promise you, I promise you, the things to which I call you, I will help you. You're not alone. So there is this assurance of assistance. And when Christ calls us to big things, he strengthens us. By this, verse 8, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. And it is in doing the works of Christ that we both prove and fulfill, work out this fruit that he is growing in our life. And so secondly, I want to look together at the proof of productivity 
pro- the proof of productivity. And I, I don't mean just like being efficient. I mean producing fruit, okay? Now listen, this fundamental assumption has already been made by Jesus. Remember he said, true disciples bear fruit. He's already said this in the passage. Uh, if, if, you're, if, you're a true, if you're a true branch, Christ will, or God will prune you so that you grow. Or you, you produce more fruit, okay? So you can, exp- you, you can be assured you're a true disciple if you're experiencing prunings, you can produce more fruit. Because true disciples bear fruit. And this is not a new theme. He's already given the disciples a primary kind of signaler that they're true disciples multiple times throughout the passage. Remember in 1336, it's love for one another. And in chapter 14, it's their obedience. So he's going back to this theme. How can you test true disciples? How can you be sure of true disciples? Love, obedience, and bearing fruit. Just like you can prove an apple tree is an apple tree by what? That it grows apples. Or I'm from the south. We like peaches there. You know a peach tree by the fruit? By what it looks like? You know a disciple by its fruit. By what it looks like. By what it produces in its life and in the lives of others. Remember we said a few weeks ago when we were talking about the test of a true disciple, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, probably is a duck. If it looks like a Christian, sounds like a Christian, it probably is a Christian. If it looks like the fruit of Christ, it probably is. Keeping in mind, there can be fakes. You say, well, how do we know the fakes? Are they being pruned? Listen, I'm wary, I am wary of people who claim to be Christians and have an all-too-easy life. I just am. Because true Christians are pruned so that they can bear fruit. So what are you producing in your life? What are you reproducing in your life? What's the effect of your life in others? Are you parenting so that as the fruit of Christ flourishes in you, you are doing your best, even if that child is not yet saved, you're doing your best to show them, here's what the fruit of Christ looks like, here's what the fruit of Christ tastes like. Here's what it looks like to be a true disciple. So they can identify that fruit in you. Are you active in church because you know it, 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 it fulfills some sense of religious activity? Are you active in church because it's an opportunity for you to, ex, to grow and, 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 and produce the fruit of Christ in your life by, by being under the preaching of the word and listening to the word and singing the word and, and praying and fellowship with one another, the togetherness of one another? It's a place where you can exercise the gifts God has given you and When you are pruned and it really hurts in life, you come to the church here and you find safety because people are helping you and they understand what it means to be pruned too. The fruit of Christ bears obvious marks. So first of all, you can be assured that God, that Jesus specifically will help. Secondly, you can you can guarantee that a true disciple will bear true fruit. There's the proof of productivity. Thirdly, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, again, this is one of those verses, one of the things I want you to do when you read the Bible, and maybe this is a Pastor Fisher thing, say wow occasionally, right? This is one of those that you just go, what? Are you serious? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you with the perfection of the love of God the Father. So the Son expresses that affection towards those who are truly His. Now, there are certain things reserved for Jesus because He's Jesus, right? 
Even in the book of John, John chapter 3, the Father loves the Son, has given all things into his hands. I know God has not given all things into your hands. Okay? We try to live like he does sometimes. I'm in control of this, and I'm in control of this, and I'm in control of this because I have all things in my hands. No, you don't. John chapter 10, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Did you hear that verse? We, we studied it because we're in John. For this reason, one of, the, one of the express motivations of God's divine affection for his son is because he was obedient even to the point of death on a cross. If you were to ask me, why do you love your son? I'd list a bunch of silly reasons. I'd list some serious ones. My son is strong in all the good ways and in all the bad ways. My son, is he loves to hug, and then he loves to fight, so it's a problem. If you ask God, why do you love Jesus? He would say, because he's going to die. He's going to rise again. Because he will die and be lifted up again. John 17. He's praying. We're going to get there. I'm so excited to get to John 17. Father, I desire that they also, he's praying on behalf of the disciples whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, here's a fascinating one. It says that God loves Jesus eternally from eternal, eternity past. Do we share that with Jesus? Yes. We were chosen in him before the foundations of the world in love. That's astounding. So it should be noted here that obviously we do not receive from the love all the benefits or the expressions the way that Jesus does in the love of God because obviously we're not given all things. It's not our place to be given all things, but we, are, but we learn in tracing that, that this love that it's it's the affection, this astounding affection that we share with the Son. That as God loves Him, so we are loved by the Son. So thirdly, we find that there's compassion through God's commandments. Because look at the self-perpetuating reality. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. If you love me, obey. Do you need a better example for that? Because I love my Father and I obey. So if you continue in the love that you know from the Son, you will obey Him. As He continues in the divine love with His Father, from His Father, by His Father, as a result... He obeys. And we as like, as 21st century New Testament Christians, we make like the law and doing what God says as as legalism and, and whatever. If you love God, you obey Him. You obey what He says. Why? Why wouldn't you? Do you love Him? Because here's what He says. Here's what he says. So do you love him enough to do it? Yes. I mean, I think so. Then be anxious for nothing. But in everything, pray. I, do you love him enough to obey his word? I, I think I love him enough. Do you read the word? Do you meditate on the word? Do you prioritize a New Testament congregation? Every issue of disobedience is reduced, I said it last, I said a few weeks ago, is reduced down, down to a lack of love. So let's ask for Jesus' help to love God more. 
And I'm not in a place to be disloyal or to only live out his love selectively. Do you know why? Because his proof of love for me was blood trickling down a cross. His proof proof of love for me was a body that was marred beyond human resemblance. His proof of love to me was a calling out of sin and a restoration to himself. And so I'm not in a place to go, I I love you, but I don't like that one, so I'm not going to do that one. If we're not going to obey, we can't claim love. I'm talking to myself here too. So let's be careful with our categories and our terminology. So we are assured assistance, help. We are assured that we will produce fruit. This is a a review of something he's already said. We are assured that if we continue in Christ, we will know divine and astounding Love. And we're assured one more thing in the passage. These things I have spoken to. I think he's being very specific. And he's being, I think he's saying everything he said in the upper room. I don't think he's talking about teaching all the way up to his ministry. I think he's being very specific. The upper room teaching that my joy may be in you. And that your joy may be full. So finally... We are assured the joy of Jesus. We are assured the joy of Jesus. Jesus in the upper room has promised his peace would be unto us, chapter 14, verse 27, that we would continue in his love, 1510, and now he says you will have his joy. Isn't God a kind God? You want peace? Here's my son. You want stability and true love? Here's my son. You want joy in life? Jesus has got it, and he wants to share it with you. He has it fully and perfectly. He wants to share it with you. There are certain contingencies to this joy because again, now we're back in the, now we're back in the part of the, the, the theology where it's going, I don't, I don't always experience that. How many of you feel joyful all the time? Yeah. <laughs> no one raised their hand. That's, I think that's honest. Yeah. We're, we don't always feel this, do we? But we already said it. First of all, it's because we don't place our hope in our feelings. But there's another reason we don't always experience this joy. Now listen, it's not that it's taken away from you. There's another reason we don't always experience this joy that we already have. And it's because these things I have spoken to you. So Jesus says, you got to listen to these things to know the fullness of this joy. You have to obey. You have to continue in my love. You have to produce fruit. Or absolutely this joy will not be at its full effect in your life because you're living for yourself. If you live for Jesus the way Jesus intended it, you'll have his joy. The natural response here is to try to determine if we feel this joy. Do I feel that? Jesus says I have joy. Do I feel it all the time? That's not right. That's not the, the best question. Because you have already been given, as Jesus says in the passage, full possession of this joy. The question is, are you living out that life? It's not like Jesus converted you and then said, here's joy, and it's like this packaged present that you have to carry around with you all the time, and you open it when you're happy, and then put it away when you're not. It's internal to the union of Christ. When you receive Christ, and he's in you, and you're in him, this comes with it. Isn't that awesome? But we don't always live it out because we don't listen to these things. So continue in Him. Ask for His strength and continue in His love that your joy may be full. 
So we are assured help. We're assured help. We are absolutely assured that true disciples will grow. We are assured divine love as shared between God and the Son so we know from the Son Himself. And we are assured joy. Everything that the human heart wants. Everything. Meaning, fulfillment, stability, all found in just listening to Jesus. And continuing in Jesus. So let's live out this fruit. Let's listen to these things. Let's be faithful in our union to Christ and live out the Christ life. It is no longer us who live, but but Christ who died and Him that lives in us. Let's take advantage of the divine resources available to us and ask for help. Let's be kept fully and assured of this love. I promise you, brother and sister, you rest in the love of God. It'll get rid of your fear. I promise you. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it'll happen. Let's obey him and know this endless, full, overflowing joy promised to us in the person of Jesus Christ, given to us in the union that we now endure and enjoy through Jesus Christ. Let's show the world what true branches bearing fruit look like, what it tastes like, and they may want it. Two.